Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you for having me. It's a delight. I'm uh, excited to be here. Uh, I'm happy you're here. Congrats on the book. It's fantastic. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, uh, your historic run and uh, Obama got behind you. Oprah got behind you. Do you remember getting the phone call that Oprah is like, wants to support? Oh, yeah. So she called and we had to pull off on the side of the highway because we were heading into one of those parts of Georgia that did not have cell service. Oh. And I sort of scared the driver. I'm like, we've got to pull over now. Oprah's on the phone. <laughs> do whatever you have to do. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, we like barely avoided an aardvark or something. It was, it was, it was dynamic. <laughs> um, uh, your book, uh, Our Time Is Now, uh, you, you wanted it to come out uh, now, uh, as soon as possible, uh, because, uh, because why? Tell people. One is that we're in the midst of primaries, and we often think that voter suppression only exists in the general election, that it's Democrats versus Republicans. And I wanted people to really understand that suppression is a system, and that system exists year-round, whether we're picking our side or they're picking their side. And if you don't understand that it's always present, then you're going to ignore it or think that it's just about politicians being mad at each other. So I wanted to use the book and the timing to give people time to absorb it, to understand it, and to know what to look for so we can fight for fair elections in November. Uh, the, the beginning of the book, the introduction, you, you tell this great story about the first time your, your grandma voted. So my grandmother, uh, we call her, her name is Wilter. They call her Bill. I was very confused as a child for a very long time about, <laughs> you know, because my grandfather was, his name was Walter and they called him Jim. So it was a lot of names that did not make sense. <laughs> so, you know, I, during my campaign, I was home for a visit and I was talking to my grandmother. She was watching what was happening here in Georgia uh, as more and more about the voter suppression was coming out. And she decided to tell me about the first time she voted. She didn't want to. She had watched her children uh, be arrested and attacked during the civil rights movement. Her husband had served in two wars on behalf of the United States and was never allowed to vote. She had been you know, assailed herself and she just didn't trust that the right to vote was real. My grandfather kept urging her from the front room to come and come and vote because that was during the time where people used to dress up to go and vote. And it was the first time black people in Mississippi would have had a chance to vote in a presidential election in modern times. And she just didn't want to go. And when she told me the story, wow. she wanted me to understand it wasn't that she was. It wasn't just the fear. It was fear, not just fear of the guns and the hoses and the dogs. It was fear of the power. For something to be denied for so long, it was hard to believe it was real. And where my grandfather was excited about it, she was just filled with trepidation and, and shame that she didn't want to risk it, just in case this time it was also a lie. Isn't that, un it's, it's unbelievable when you hear those stories and it's, you know, uh, here we are today and there's voter suppression still today. I mean, we saw this happen in Georgia, it was insane. Exactly. And people were waiting outside during a pandemic, and you go, what the heck is going on? Uh, how, how do we stop this? Well, the first thing is that if you want to dismantle a system, you've got to understand it. Yeah. And you know, what my grandmother wanted me to understand, what I want folks to understand, is that the age of you know, guns and dogs and hoses being the barrier to voting is gone. Today, it's, it's labyrinthine administrative rules. It's having to know based on the day you move to a new state, how many days you have until you can get registered. It's being able to register to vote and not have your application thrown out because someone didn't know how to spell your last name and wouldn't ask. But it's also about having a polling place shut down, which is part of what happened in Georgia. We had one polling location that had to serve 16,000 people in a single day with the same number of machines they used to have when they were serving only a few thousand. And so it's understanding that it's complex now, that it's designed to look like user error, it's designed to look like just bureaucracy, and it's designed to make you doubt that you didn't make the mistake. And, and that's what's so insidious about it. We no longer treat voter suppression as the responsibility of those who are in charge of elections, we blame each other instead of blaming the system and blaming the people responsible for making the system so hard. Uh, you also talk in the book about how important uh, the census is as well. So the census is that, you know, it seems like this annoying, intrusive statistical 
thing that happens every 10 years. Yeah. Most of us respond just because we believe the, the red letter saying this is a federal crime if you don't reply. But too often the people who most need to be seen are afraid of it. And unfortunately, in this administration, uh, Donald Trump has been very intentional about trying to scare people out of completing the census or underfunding it. Uh, and it's based on an analysis that they got from a, a gentleman named Thomas Hofeller, who said that if you could get people not to participate in the census, especially communities of color, the nation would look more Republican and white. And that's just not who we are. Those communities that are being overlooked now, that are suffering now, it's because they were discounted 10 years ago. But it's also political power. The districts that get drawn for elections are drawn based on these numbers. And if you aren't counted, you are counted out for 10 years. 10 years. And the 10 years, and that's a long time yeah, to is. go, to be ignored by those who are responsible for making choices on your behalf. Stacey, you're on the short list uh, of the possible uh, VP running mate uh, for Joe Biden. Uh, obviously, you can't speak much about that, but uh, if that does happen, who's your first call? Oh, my mom and dad. <laughs> Just give it, really? I mean, they gotta be, they'll, they have to be so proud with everything you're doing. I said mom first because she's the most likely to answer the phone when I call, but she'll call daddy over to listen. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the way, that's my, my mom was like that too, yeah. I would... <laughs> No matter what, my dad would even, he wouldn't even go near the phone. That was her thing. And she would get on, and she would just talk and talk. I could put the phone down, walk down the block, come back, and <laughs> we're still mid-conversation. But I love that you, uh, that, that would be your first call. Uh, thank you so much for coming on our show. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, I hope to talk to you uh, in the future. Thank you so much. I, it, I truly am honored to be here. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I said... And it's going